Good morning, afternoon and evening everyone. Today on the FPL Wire, we will be looking at the promoted teams and West Ham ahead of the 2021 season. I'm your host Zofa and I'm joined as always by my co-host Late Riser. How's it going buddy? Good. I mean, the Euros are finally over. A uh, heartbreak for all the English fans. But I thought the tournament in general was just such a great watch. And, you know, not playing fantasy was just a little bit of a refreshing change uh, after the, the, you know, especially since we were producing so much content. After how rigorous it gets during the season, it was nice to just sit back and enjoy the football. And I really, really enjoyed the tournament. How about you, Zof? You enjoyed watching the Euros? Yep. My sleep cycle completely went for a toss. Sleeping at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., waking up at 8 a.m. the next day. So, in a way, I'm glad it's over. We have one month of normality before the Premier League comes back. Yep, yep. And I'm excited. I mean, uh, I think everybody has uh, got an appetite for FPL now because everybody is ready to drive right into it. We're exactly one month away from game week one. And I'm really excited to have the guest we, on, have, we have on today. I, with us today, we have Luke, who, will, who you'll also know from Twitter as FPL Irons. I got really, I got talking to Luke on uh, the fantasy champ man uh, pod, Wolf, Wolf, Wolf pod about a year and a half ago and it was great i was just blown away by the sheer amount of knowledge that this guy had i've been li- i've been a regular listener of the wolf pod that luke and andy uh host and i was upset actually that they decided to shelve it uh last season uh why luke is the right person to have on the pod today is because he finished ninth in the gaffer game which is the fantasy game for the championship and he's seen a lot of championship football he's looked at a lot of championship stats and we're going to be talking about all three promoted uh, promoted teams today so he's the right person to talk to outside of that i mean i've always gone to him whenever i'm in need of data from the hammers and he's a diehard west ham fan as well so we're going to be talking about these four clubs today and hopefully provide a lot of value to you guys hi luke how's it going are you over what happened on sunday no, not at all. I don't think I'll ever get over that. Um, as, as you say, I'm a West Ham fan and an England fan, so my life has been filled with, well, not very much joy. So, yeah, uh, seeing England win a, a European Championship would have been fantastic. But when I do finally see West Ham win a cup or England win a cup, it will be fantastic. Hopefully it will come in my lifetime, but uh, we'll have to see. Definitely. More more uh, running videos from your neighbor's uh, ring bell after that, I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I thought I'd be safe from the, the world of uh, social media running down my my road, which is uh, yeah, not, not overly highly populated. But my, my fiancé got a, a video saying, we've just picked up Luke running down the road on our ring doorbell. And... Yeah, it, I couldn't not share the footage. I think it ended up with about 20,000 views on my account. Wow. But um, yeah, that, that, that England-Germany game just meant so much to me. I, I had to just, I just sprinted down the road. <laughs> that's, that's all I could do. Yeah, I've seen that video at least 10 times. It was just such a great watch. I enjoy watching that. So uh, we're going to get right uh, into it. You reckon, off. we'll start with the... Yes, let's just get our sponsor plugs in. Start yep. with... Dream set. Go with the new mic. I was, thought I would freestyle it, but I thought let's give the old script a go with the new mics we have today. So a quick word about our sponsors. Dream set Go is a global portal for fans to gain access to sporting events around the world. Accommodation, flight tickets, hospitality, stadium visits. Everything can be tailored exactly to your requirements. They also do celebrity experiences, which include masterclasses with your favorite sports celebrity or something as simple as birthday shout outs. You can find links to the products in the description below. Also, uh, the FPL Wire is a part of the Fantasy Football Network, uh, Fantasy Football Scout Network. So every stat that you see on the pod, uh, we source it from Fantasy Football Scout. In case you're looking, uh, you know, to join uh, Fantasy Football Scout, we do have the sign up link in the description below. Please use that link because we're affiliate members as well. So you know, if you guys use our link to join the Scout, uh, it helps us as well. And uh, it's, it's a good time to join the Scout because I believe they have a 20% uh, discount on the annual membership as well. So yeah, join. Use the link in the description below and join Fantasy Football Scout. It's totally worth it. I mean, you guys have been watching us last season. I've been using a lot of the stats and data from Fantasy Football Scout. So go for it. Also, in case you guys haven't already joined, we have uh, an FPL Wire League as well. The league code is GKTIYM. You can see it on the screen as well. And... Uh, 
that's it from us. Uh, also, just before we move into the questions and we jump right into it, make sure you're hitting the like button and the subscribe button because the like button really, really helps the YouTube algorithm and helps our channel grow. And uh, we've got a lot more content for you in this preseason as well. So subscription will help. All right, Zoff, I, I think you can- first with Brentford. All right, let's go for it. Luke, the floor is yours. Yeah, for me, for me Brentford's uh it's a it's a pretty easy one. Brentford are a, a one man side when it comes to fantasy. Um, Tony was kind of Gaffer's version of Mo Salah every single week, returning brilliant. Forty three goals and assists last year in forty eight games. Um, for me, I, I don't think he'll struggle too much in the in the Premier League. Um, he's he's kind of got a bit of everything. Brentford were were very clever when they bought him, bought him in. Obviously, they lost Ollie Watkins, who scored a an insane amount of goals. They had a front three two years ago of uh, Brian and Brian and Bremo, uh, Ben Rama, and also Ollie Watkins. They lost Ben Rama, and they lost Watkins. And what they did is they thought we need somebody who can replicate what he did because he was so fantastic in our system. So they went the league down to Peterborough, and they found a man who was strong. He can jump. He can win balls in the air. He's also got enough pace to get in behind, but he's also a fantastic finisher. He scored volleys, left foot, right foot, outside of the box, headers, scored a lot of headers, which surprised me. And his penalties, he he does the penalty that I'm not a fan of, but he's very good at it. He does the little stutter and then puts oh, it in the corner that the goalkeeper doesn't jump. I'm, I'm, after, after Sunday, not a fan, but he does it well. So, so I'll, I'll let him off. But um, I've seen a lot of questions coming in that will Tony be good against will Tony be good when Brentford have got the ball without the ball when they're pressing when they're not pressing for me Tony can do absolutely everything and for 6.5 million he's just going to replicate what Watkins did for Villa in my opinion Watkins had a very good season and especially in terms of FPL points and I think Tony will be exactly the same um you might not always get the returns you expect, but he's always going to be involved. If Brentford score three goals, I'd be shocked if he didn't get at least a goal and an assist or two goals. Um, he was involved in, I think, 51% of all the goals they scored last season. So six and a half million for a team that are going to look to attack. We spoke about it actually just before we start podcasting. Um, you mentioned Blackpool from a few years ago. I see Brentford being like that. If, if they look to win a game, they'll, they'll get lots of four threes as opposed to one nils. So... It's an attacking side with a player that's going to be involved in pretty much everything. Six and a half million. I'm not surprised he's so highly owned. He's, he really is a fantastic player. Do you, do you think Brentford themselves uh, will uh, make the jump? I mean, it's the first time they're entering the Premier League in their entire history as well. Do you think they'll comfortably make the jump and they'll be able to create enough, even if uh, Tony is talismanic and has... 50% uh, of a goal involvement rate. What do, you, what do you think about Brentford and their style of play and whether it'll be an easy uh, jump for them into the Premier League? Yeah, it's tough. We, we've seen this from a lot, of, uh, a lot of sides that are promoted. It's either sink or swim. And, and I think if you said to me right now, which team do you think will stay up, most likely to stay up, I think I'd say Watford just based on experience and their defensive now. If you said to me, which team do you think could come top half? I would say Brentford. Because I think if, if they, you, you see it from these promoted sides, all it takes is a good run at the start, which is why I'm so upset about Norwich's early fixtures, because they, they, they've, really been, they, they've really been hurt by those fixtures. Whereas Brentford have got some winnable fixtures. If they come up and they get 10 points from the first six games and they're comfortably mid-table, they can just ease themselves in. Um, and for me, if there's any team that could do what Leeds did last year, it's Brentford. Um, they keep the ball. Their, their press is fantastic. They don't stop running. It's 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 very similar to what Leeds do. The likes of Bumbuemo and and Canyos were very very good last season. Just constantly on the on the last man, they cut inside and the fullbacks overlap. So, in terms of the defensive assets, I like Rico Henry. Very good. Always looking to bomb on. Got a late injury which caused them to. Uh, end up playing a 3-5-2 towards the latter stage of the season. But I think they'll revert to the 4-3-3 and it will look a lot like a lot like Liverpool. Full-backs bomb on, uh, wingers come inside, try and get shots away. Tony will be there to head balls in, tap balls in, whatever he needs to do. 
and the midfield will just look to keep the ball, press as much as they can and just cause the opposition problems, which is, I think, a very good way for a newly promoted side to come up and play football. If you come in, teams are going to think, oh, it's only Brentford, we'll get a result against them, we'll be fine. And they're instantly in your face. I, I like think that's that. a hard thing to deal with. I like that. Sounds very interesting. So what would we say is a typical Brentford goal? Do they have a particular philosophy? Like, you know, the Man City goal, we know it's usually a yep. low cross from the winger with a tap in. So what is the signature Brentford goal? So Brentford tend to play very much centrally. They'll keep the ball in the central area, look, look to, to hold on to possession. They have a lot of very good technical players, a lot of tacticians. Um, the likes of, of, of Jensen in midfield, De Silva in midfield, they look to, in a similar way to Barella for, for Italy, as a Metzala, kind of finding those spots out, out wide if they can, drifting across and, and just crossing balls in, constant balls into the box through balls. The philosophy is let's try and create chances. Because at the end of the day, if you play football by numbers, if you, if you create as many chances as you can, get as many shots away, you're going to score some goals. And that's, that's what Brentford are about. You know, even if they have a bad day at the office, I think they're going to create two, three, four key chances w- without even having a good day. And it's all very quick, efficient uh, passing. Yeah. And it's not possession style of football with Brentford. Um, I think that they're, they're, they do keep possession, not, not to the degree of, that Norwich do. They're clever on the ball. They make good decisions. But at the same point, they're not scared to try and pick out that killer pass, which I think sets them aside from a team like Norwich. Norwich are very, very much keep the ball, keep the ball, keep the ball, and we'll see where that gets us. Brentford are, we'll keep the ball, but if we get a chance, let's try and take it. Let's, let's, let's try and find a ball in behind, try and get the ball quickly out to one of our fullbacks and get the ball into the box and, and cause a bit of chaos. Nice, nice. Tell us, tell us a little bit about their manager. Yeah, Thomas Frank, he, he, he's done a fantastic job. But Brent, Brentford were, have always been a side that looked like they could get promoted. They just needed to finally get it done. We, I, th- I thought they were fantastic the season the season before where they lost the playoff final against Fulham. But as I say, the thing that I respect about him is it's tough to take a playoff final loss. That's, that's a, I've, I've been there as a West Ham fan and it's, it's difficult. It, 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 it can make you second guess what you need to do at a club. But he, he stuck to what he'd done this, the season before, he got to another playoff final and this year they got it done. And... That's why I'm, I'm, I'm so certain that he'll continue to keep playing the way that he always has, because that's, that's what Brentford are. But Brentford have a philosophy. And I, I don't see that all of a sudden they'll start to play a back five with defensive midfielders sitting in front and hope Tony can do something. I think they'll keep playing heavy metal football and they'll, they'll have the odd week where Man City beat them 7-0, Chelsea beat them 5-0, I'm sure. But at the same point, like Leeds last year, they'll have those results against the lower teams and they'll, they'll get four, five, six nil wins as well. That It can easily happen. Somebody like somebody fun to captain against, right? Out of all the three teams, I think Norwich and Brentford sounds like they'll be fun to captain against. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, at, at, the, at the end of the day, as I say, we, we saw it opening day of last season. Um, everybody had said Leeds are a fantastic football team. They're going to come up and they're going to try and play football. They did that away at Anfield. Salah got his hat trick. We could we could quite easily see that. Um, although I wouldn't advise getting a Bamiang in. There's there's no reason why a Bamiang or Lacazette or whoever it may be go absolutely insane on the fight the first day of the season because Brentford are going to go. We don't care that we're playing Arsenal. We're going to play football and Arsenal put them to the sword and beat them four 0 it, it could quite easily happen. Do they set up any differently home or away, or is it just one simple system which they like to stick to? See, this is um, when I had a look into Brentford, they they pretty much had the same points home and away. They kept they made them um, made up 51.7% of their points at home. So pretty even, but it's difficult to analyze that in a in in the year of COVID where there were no fans. So can we can we take much out of that? I'm not so sure. And obviously there's no more than that than that one one year of, of data with regards to, to COVID. But I think they'll be strong, strong at home. They'll, they'll try and keep their fans entertained, potentially be a little bit more passive away, but not, not much. I, I honestly think they'll, be, they'll, they'll replicate what Leeds did, where Leeds, they didn't care that they played away at Man U or at home to, 
West Brom last season. It was the same football. And I think we'll see that from Brentford. Do you think they have as much quality as the Leeds did? Because if you're trying to play that heavy metal football, it can either go the Leeds way or it can go the Norwich way as well. So, I mean, both are possibilities. Yeah, I think for me, the only player for Leeds that is world-class or, or top, top elite level is, is Rafinha. Outside of that, Calvin Phillips is a good player. Bamf- Bamford was championship level before he came up. Jack Harrison had only ever played at championship level. And because of the system, because of the management, they looked fantastic, didn't they? So there's no reason why these players can't make the step up. P- players like Tony and, and Brian and Buemo, who have consistently scored goals at championship and, and league one level, there's no reason why in the right system they can't do the same. We, we've seen a lot of poor players come into the Premier League and score a lot of goals because they're playing for the right team. And I, th- I think Tony and, and Buemo can, can be those players. I think those two players are where everybody's interest is lying when it comes to Brentford's attack. I mean, Mbuemo, how do you pronounce it? Mbuemo? Uh, it's got, uh, he, Bra- Brian Mbuemo. Yeah, he got eight and eight goals and 10 assists. Last season and the season before that also, he got around 15 goals and eight assists. So it's been, he's been fairly consistent for two seasons now. Yeah. Do you think there's a case, uh, you know, because we have so many options up front, I mean, the yes. 6.5 to 8 million striker price uh, striker pool is flooded with good options. Do you think it's uh, maybe smart to go for an MBUMO in midfield at 5.5 million or just don't overthink it, go Tony, because he's a talisman? So I think for, for me, if you are set on your strikers, you know, if you want to go for Kane and Calvert Lewin in a 4 4 2, whatever it may be, Brian and Bremo, you could do a lot worse. Um, for me personally, I think he's the best 5.5 million option we've got right now. You've got the likes of Smith Rowe at Arsenal, but if they can't, do manage to get Odegaard back in or they change to a 4-3-3 with a more defensive style, there's no, there's no, he's a young player. He's certainly not nailed and he's nowhere near a talisman for that side. Whereas if Tony and, and Buemo don't play well this season, they're going down. It's as simple as that. So... You know what you're getting from a player like this in the same way you did from Jack Harrison, from Bamford, from, from Rafinha. You knew that they were playing for an attacking side. You knew they were going to play every game and they're going to get chances. So you can take a punt on the likes of Smith Rowe. For me, this is actually a much safer pick despite the fact we don't know how Brentford are going to play. Is he going to play in midfield, you think, or up top? I noticed they played a variety of systems. You mentioned it earlier. I think they played a back four, they played a back three. So where do you think Mbuemo is going to play? Yeah, so the last two seasons, they predominantly played a 4-3-3, um, with Mbuemo coming off the right-hand side, cutting in onto his left foot. Um, the reason they played a 3-5-2 late on last season was because Rico Henry and... Uh, Dalsgaard also got injured, who were their two fullbacks. So they had to change system and play a three at the back. And Umbuema actually ended up becoming a wing back, and so did uh, Canyos, their other winger. So oh, I think you you if if Brentford are definitely playing the 4-3-3, Umbuema is the one to go to. If they're playing the 3-5-2, he's either going to be out of position up front with Tony or playing as a wing back. So I'd rather he was safe as a, in as the winger in a 4-3-3. Because if they play the 3-5-2, you could buy him thinking he's going to play up front every week next to Tony. And then you see that he's going to be playing right wing back against Arsenal on the first game of the season, which you then don't want to go anywhere near him. But wasn't he playing wing back only because uh, there were injuries in that yeah. position? So, if, so it's yeah, more they, likely if they're playing three at the back, he's more likely to play up front, right? If they're playing, th- if they're playing three at the back, he could potentially play as the right-sided wing-back because they've lost Dalsgaard. He's gone back to, I believe, the Danish league. So, potentially, he could play on that right, right-hand right side of a, of a back three um, as the wing-back. So, if you don't, if we're not 100% that they're playing the 4-3-3, three, three, he's, a, he's a wait and see. But if they're playing the 4-3-3, three, three, you could easily get, get in on him the first week of the season. Interesting. So they have, I heard, they have a sort of a money ball sort of strategy about relating to their transfers. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so that as t- Tony was an unbelievable, so I think they're going for 5 million, which you look at the numbers that he produced, that's a fantastic signing. I think if anybody wanted him now, they'd probably sell him for the same sort of money they did with Watkins. You're looking 30, 35 million if, if 
a mid-table side like Leeds or West Ham or Aston Villa wanted him, it, it would cost 30 odd million. So very much money ball orientated. They're currently looking at um, Harry Wilson from Liverpool, which would be a, would be a very good sign. And he played for Cardiff last season and, and absolutely ran the show for them. He was he was very very good. I'd I'd expect him to play off the left hand side if he did if he did sign for them. Likely take a lot of free kicks. Very good at free kicks. He'd probably take the corners as well. He hasn't been priced in FPL yet, which is a shame. I, I, I looked just then, was hoping that he'd be five and a half, maybe five. Um, if he goes to to Brentford for, if he's five or five and a half million, taking set pieces, very very strong, very very strong asset. Yeah, just 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 for our listeners, those that don't know actually the Brentford story, there are claims that Brentford actually have the most advanced uh, data driven. Uh, recruitment system in the country, in England at the moment. So their owner, Matthew Benham, he used to actually run a betting company and he's very, very heavy on data anal- analytics. And that's what they're doing with their recruitment as well. Uh, I mean, I think their uh, net profit over the last three, four years has been staggeringly good. So, and, and he's at the pinnacle of what they were achieving to do, which is play in the Premier League. So it's just a great story. If you haven't already read up about it, I, I insist that you do. Cool. So let's just sum up Brentford before we move on. So I think it's pretty clear the best forward pick is Tony. I see Force played some minutes. Does he sub on or what, where, what does he normally play? So, yeah, Force was, uh, he's kind of their, their big man. The, the, the guy that will cause a bit of bit of trouble late on if they needed a result. They, they'd switch up to maybe a 4-4-2 or a 3-5-2 and get him on next to Tony. Um, yeah, he's, he's very much just a, just a sub. Um, un- unlikely to get enough minutes to for us to to really care cool i think in midfield i think we're pretty clear as mbo mm-hmm. i saw there's yes. nobody you would prefer over an mbo at the moment um not not personally at the moment i think there's i i spoke to a, a brentford fan and he he likes the look of de silva but he's he's a he's a little bit raw at the moment like a good player presses well tries hard at the moment potentially not premier league level but is one to keep an eye on. Actually, I was just, uh, you know, during off-season, I was listening to James Plant of Pale's uh, Brentford correspondent pod as well, yeah. and he was as well very hot on De Silva. He's like the most exciting player that they have coming through the ranks at the yeah. moment. So that sounds interesting. I think he. This would be, they basically have, uh, they don't have an academy, and they have an A team and a B team. And what they do is whoever's looking... Uh, Likely uh, and not yet ready for the A team, they let let them play in the B team, get experience with uh, pros as well, and then they get promoted to the A team structure, which is completely it's it's just different to what every other Premier League is, club is doing out there. So I find that fascinating. Anyone in defence that you like? For me, it's it's a pretty simple one. It's 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 Rico Henry or or, or bust for me. I think if you want to go near their defence, it's you've you've got to go for the attacking wing back. Um, if they're playing a three-five-two and he's playing the left wing back role, that's a, that's a really solid option. But even as a even as the fullback, he he creates a lot of chances. He was un, unfortunate last year not to get more returns, but he's always involved. So if if they have a nice run where you like the look of them defensively, Rico Henry for me. But you wouldn't recommend uh, early season going there, right? No, no, I I'd, I'd take the punt offensively. Okay. Not, not defensively. And who's on set pieces? We know Tony takes penalties. Uh, what about yep. corners, uh, free kicks? It, it, it tends to be Jensen. Um, sometimes Mbwemo takes a few. So we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens. But Mbwemo could be on a few set pieces as well as having some pretty good underlying stats as well. So he's, he's a he's certainly someone you could take a punt on if you didn't want Tony. Fair enough. I mean, Jensen's on set pieces and he's 5 million. You'd, you'd much rather just spend the 0.5 more and go for it. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Anything else off? Or, or I think, yes, I think we can move back, then we'll summarize everything once we go position by position. Now let's move on to Norwich. Uh, so what, what I found, uh, Luke, is that a lot of people are actually underrating uh, Norwich a little. And uh, I, I'm guessing that's primarily because they've lost their talisman in Bundia. Uh, but what I noticed with what 
uh, when I was looking at the numbers is that uh, when they were promoted the last time, the this time around they scored a significantly fewer goals and they conceded a significantly fewer goals. So have Norwich matured? How was their season? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so Norwich, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one to analyse Norwich. I think, as you say, people are underrating them, but I think that's purely because of the fixtures. You look at the opening fixtures, why, why would you go anywhere near Norwich with Liverpool at home, City away, Leicester at home, Arsenal away? There's just no point. So the, the, the positive we do have with Norwich is it is a wait and see. We can literally sit there and see what happens to them, how they're playing. Um, it's, diff- it's difficult to, to, to explain how they're going to progress as a Premier League side because they're probably their two most influential players last season now on at the club. Um, Brian Deere, from an, uh, from an attacking perspective, incredible from the wing was involved in 41 percent of their goals just unbelievable 15 goals 16 assists involved in quite literally everything they did um going to be a hell of a player for villa and in midfield norwich's philosophy was kind of we're going to be very timid very tame in in comparison to how we were when we previously got promoted which was a bit more like brentford a bit more heavy metal they just kept the ball. Oliver Skip was fantastic at that. Very much a metronome in midfield. Just kept the ball ticking along. If you needed to play it backwards, he'd play it backwards. If he could find a pass, he would. But that was very much on the off chance if he could see the pass. Other than that, it was just sideways passing. We'll keep the ball. We'll keep the ball. If we have the ball, we can't concede. But also, we're not going to get the ball forward. So we're going to create less chances. Pookie, still just as good as ever. Great finisher. He, he, he does what he did last time he came up. Um, he's going to be in and around the box. He's going to try and get himself into, into goal scoring uh, opportunities, getting himself into the box, into the six yard box. They take a lot of shots from the edge of the box, which is odd. Um, I don't know how to describe it. They kind of get wound up because they play the ball. They play with the ball so. Um, they're kind of so scared to create chances quickly that they end up getting themselves into a bit of a tizzy and then go, what am I going to do? I'll just take a pot shot. They scored a lot of goals from outside the box last year. A lot of them were very lucky deflected goals or Emmy Brian Dia being a very good player. So again, the likelihood of those outside of the box goals coming again, I don't see it happening. Uh, not sustainable at all. Defensively, they were better. They were a lot better, which is strange because, in my opinion, the defence is actually worse. When they came, when they were in the Premier League last time, they had Godfrey and Jamal Lewis. Now they have, potentially they're just a bit more experienced now, so they've now got Ben Gibson and um, Grant Hanley, which you know it's it's not the it's not the most attractive back 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 four you'll ever have. You know it's not sexy football, but they do a job clearly, which is which is a good thing. So. There may be more clean sheets coming your way from Norwich this season. The wing backs aren't the most attacking wing backs you're ever going to find. If you are going to go near them, Max Ahrens is, is the one in the same way Rico Henry was for Brentford. Pookie for six million is going to get goals, but not in those opening games. Norwich, Norwich's whole season is going to come down to these new signings. Because if the new signings aren't good enough, aren't good enough for the Premier League standard. Uh, Billy Gilmore has to replicate what Ollie Skip did. If Ollie Skip doesn't sign for the club, is he at that level yet? Hopefully, he is. Um, Do you still expect Skip to join? Because I think the decision is made, which is why they went all in on Gilmore for the loan. I think yeah. because because Skip was such an important part of their tip team last season, and I think uh, Nuno is going to probably give Skip a chance. I reckon. Yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree. I, it's a shame because Skip was phenomenal last season for Norwich really was very very good um he, he'd fit into any side probably from sixth downwards in the Premier League very good on the ball um Rashika has to perform because at the end of the day they've signed him for 10 million which for Norwich is quite a lot of money and he has to uh, replicate what Buendia did which is it's not going to be easy especially given the, the recent form he's had for, for Werder Bremen. He's, he's going to struggle. Five and a half million could become a bit of a bargain if he does look good. But I, I, for me, Norwich would be my, my tip to get relegated off the bat, which is a shame because I'd love to see them come up and do well because they've had so many seasons where they've, 
they're such a yo-yo club at the moment. I'd love to see them stay for five to ten years, but with this current crop of players, I, I don't see it. I just hope they have better luck with injuries this season because yeah. the last yes. time they were in the Premiership, I remember press conferences from Farka and they were just a long list of injuries every time he's uh, facing the press. So I just hope they have a little more luck this time. It is a shame that they've lost uh, two of their best players from last season. Rashika, do you, do you think he's got it in him? It's, it's a punt at the end of the day, right? I mean, I, I, he had three goals and one assist last season, which isn't spectacular. But the season before that, he showed some promise scoring eight and assisting five for them. Uh, but right now, just a wait and watch, you reckon, Norwich? Yeah, I think it's a wait and see. <laughs> the only thing that I've seen about Rashika is I, I looked on whoscored.com and I compared, uh, compared Brian Dia to Rashika just as players. And in terms of what, what it said, the way that they liked to play, they were very similar. Like to try and find through balls, cut inside, take shots. So I think they've, they've just kind of, as we spoke about just now with Brentford, they've sold Brian Dia for 35 million. They've bought in a replacement for 10, hoping that he can replicate what the player they just sold did. Whether that happens, we, we don't currently know. But their season is, is going to come down to him at the end of the day. It's that it's, it's, they need Campwell, Rashika and Pukki to perform, which are they good enough for that level? Not so sure. Cantwell did pretty well in the Premiership uh, last time around. I, I think he got 100 plus FPL points as well. So he does have a certain FPL pedigree, but it's a much uh, more different equ- equation when you're a 5.5 midfielder instead of a 4.51. Yeah. So and the numbers so, aren't that great. I thought like you know six goals, six assists, and you need to cut his. You know, XG plus XG for 90 isn't point that bad, right? It's 0.33. I think he missed a lot of chances. Yeah, he's not. I think we kind of look back at him in kind of a, quite a romantic way because he was 4.5 million. You know. Whenever, whenever there's a 4.5 million that gets more than 100 points, he's, he's an FPL darling, isn't he? So he's he's not he's not even close to being a, a player you could look at at five and a half million, in my, in my opinion. No, nowhere near. Um, he He's more involved in the build-up play as opposed to being the one that arrives late and gets a lot of chances. He's, he's much more technically gifted on the ball than the likes of of, of Rashika, who, who will probably be the one that gets more in and around the box with Puki. I think Campwell will be the be the one dropping a bit deeper from the wing and getting involved in the midfield if they're having a tough game, whereas Rashika will likely push forward to help Puki. So in games, they may well start in a 4-3-3, but end up playing a slightly more of a 4-4-2, maybe a bit, bit of a diamond with Campwell dropping in. Tell us more about Buendi. I'm curious because we saw him also in the Premier League last time. He posted great chance creation numbers, but yeah. the final output wasn't there. Now, the numbers are absolutely staggering this time. I look at his XG, XA of 0.63. What do you think he'll bring to Villa? And do you think he's an option for Villa's opening run of fixtures? Yeah, but very much so. As you say, Buendi, in terms of the underlying statistics when he was last in the Premier League, he was very, very good. Seven assists, but he could have could have got a lot more if, if he had better players around him, which we, we saw how poor Norwich were when they were last in the Premier League. He, it was a sinking ship from the get-go, wasn't it? So in, in this Villa team that they play quite attacking football, um, if Grealish stays, if Grealish stays and you've got a three of Grealish, Boyendia and Watkins, there's some serious value there, especially if he's going to be taking the set pieces, which he quite easily could. He's very, very good at corners and free kicks. So you look you look at the value in an in an Aston Villa winger, six and a half million corners, free kicks, creating chances for Watkins and Grealish, and potentially if they do sign a new attacking midfielder to replace Barkley, it's a strong, strong option. For me, I've currently got him in my starting lineup. I like the Villa fixtures, I like him as a player. There's a very high ceiling there, which I think is what we look for in FPL assets. We, we can you can take the safe punts or you can go out there and look for players with a ceiling and I think he's got that very very high. Yeah, what I also like with Villa is it's it's six point five for with Bundia is it's six point five million, uh, and the first three fixtures for uh, Aston Villa are absolutely amazing. We've got Watford away, Newcastle at home, and Brentford. And why I like this price point a lot is because we have so many good options at six point five million. So it's easy to move into any other in-form uh, mid-price midfield asset. So I like that punt at the start of the season a lot. And it's nice that you're going there because I've seen your draft and you don't have Rafinha at the moment and you've gone for a Bundia. Must have been a difficult... 
let's not spoil let's keep it to the end <laughs> <laughs> i just just adding context to the conversation yeah, must yeah. have been and it must have been a difficult decision for you yeah no of course it's 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 always going to be a difficult decision when you choose not to take a player like rafinha who's very very good but i think you have to weigh up the pros and cons of any decision and as much as rafinha probably is a better player than brandia those fixtures you've just mentioned are fantastic and it's quite easy to do the jump off brandia and go to rafinha when when the fixtures turn all right uh, what i mean zof actually want you to answer this question uh, is billy gilmore the best 4.5 midfielder option in the game at the moment he's your boy what do you expect from a 4.5 mid uh 90 minutes every game and some sort of i, I like bisuma last season because he used to take shots from outside the box all the time so it was a little exciting to watch but i'd be happy with 90 minutes and maybe an assist here or there yeah, so the thing with gilmore is he's not going to be as susceptible to yellow cards as bisuma definitely but i think he's more of a distributor i don't think you're going to be getting too many goals assists out of him i don't know if he's going to be taking set pieces for them in which case he might you might get something out of it but in terms of fpl output i don't expect him to be he'll get you minutes because i think he's going to be talismanic in that team he'll be one of the best players there but i don't think in terms of goals or assists i'm expecting much but i don't think he's necessarily worse than say bisuma what do you think luke right. yeah so for me i think we 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 kind of agree on the fact that he's likely to take skip's position skip was one of these midfielders that very rarely went further forward than the halfway line i expect gilmore to sit in front of the defense be there as an option for the pass quick passes here and there not looking to get the ball forward too much however if they do by some miracle manage to sign oli skip on on a permanent i think gilmore would then play the slightly more advanced role that that kenny mclean played last season and that's when he then become, becomes the obvious 4.5 million The one that I like at the moment in the 4.5 million range is potentially Morgan Gibbs White for Wolves. Um he had a loan period at Swansea last season and played just off of the striker. Very very good. Be- became an option in Gaffer very quickly. So depending on how the new management take things at Wolves, if they were to play a, a 4-2-3-1 with Gibbs White in behind Jimenez with Neto and Podence either side. he would then become the 4.5 but that's that's very much a wait and see but i i i think right now gilmore's probably the one purely because the other positive about a 4.5 is he plays for norwich are you are you ever are you ever really going to need a triple up on norwich probably not whereas exactly. the likes of basuma at brighton brighton are a good side and, and on 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 their day can can beat anyone so you may well want dunk lampty and welbeck you know it's it's unlikely but it's it's more likely than norwich and they've got a good start of the season as well i agree with you cuz i wouldn't uh, waste spots of uh, potentially important spots in your starting 11 on bench fodder cuz i i see a lot of people now that ryan's left the club they are going for sanchez and steel i I'd, mm-hmm. i'd probably throw in a foster not waste a brighton spot in your formal in keeper as well cuz i think sanchez is clear first choice and if an injury happens you just make a transfer i, I don't think you waste a spot there uh i think that covers norwich for now good few, good i have a couple more questions just go for it zof zof can you just get a little closer to the so mic to i soft? think cool. yeah, yeah. so i was just seeing who do you say is the more attacking side brentford or norwich i think norwich had seen in more shots on target but brentford had more big chances yeah so it's it's a difficult one i think in terms of probably output i think norwich probably had more as you say more shots and probably hadn't higher a higher xg as well um in terms of it's difficult looking at next season because both of them are going to have a lot less of the ball so norwich built their play off of keeping the ball having 60% possession and then trying to build through the thirds and, and get a shot away and they would do that quite well and quite effectively whereas brentford as I, as i say would always be looking to make sure that having the ball meant a chance was created whereas sometimes with norwich it wasn't even that sometimes it was going we're going to keep possession so the other team don't score um next season what do we think probably 40% possession for both is is likely for a promoted side i think next year in terms of expected goals and, and maybe goals as well brentford would be more likely to score more goals especially now with uh, boyan dia out the side boyan Bre- dia I, i can't speak highly of him enough he he absolutely ran the show for this side 
really fantastic player. So with without him and and the the, the timid nature of which they play, Brent Brentford are, are all over these lot. So all right, and when it comes to captaincy against, don't think about it twice. Whether before captaining a player against either Brentford or Norwich. Yeah, Brent Brentford or Norwich, uh, much much better captaincy options against than than the likes of Watford, who are a bit more defensively astute. The, these two, if you fancy a punt against either of these these two sides, I, I couldn't argue against it. Most most Salah on on game week one will be my captain. I'm not overthinking it. I'm with you, you on that there. after last season. <laughs> Just one last question. Any difference home versus away last time? Around, I noticed they were a lot more open at home in front of their own fans in a generally like, you know, attack the ball more, which is understandable. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I've, I've actually been lucky. Well, whether it's lucky or not, you can decide. I've, I've been to, to Carrow Road. I've watched Norwich and it's a, a very good atmosphere. It's, it's, a good, it's, a, it's a nice stadium to go to and um, they always look to put on a show for their fans. They always have done. They, they'll play attacking football. Um, which, to be honest, has probably been to the detriment of their form in the Premier League. Because you, when when you've not got the the top players in your squad, you potentially should be a bit more defensive and passive. Which you know, it, it, the way they play now may well end up keeping them in the in the league. But yeah, I think there'd be no reason to to not captain someone away at Norwich. I think actually away at Norwich could be even even better because Norwich will continue to try and at least keep the fans happy and score a few goals. Yeah, that was what I wanted to hear from, you know, you're, let's say Man City who are hosting Norwich will be a different prospect than when they visit Norwich because I remember they beat them the last time around, right? I think it was the beginning yeah. of the season they actually beat Man City at Cairo Road. So that should be interesting. Anything else? We can move on to Watford. I think we're good to move on. Cool. Why don't you tell us, Luke, a little bit about Watford, about the managerial changes and how the season went? Yeah, Watford. Watford was a strange one, as it as it always is with Watford. A managerial merry-go-round, as it always, as it always is. Um, they had Vladimir Ivic at the start of the season. They play. They started the season with a back three or a back five. Um, very very defensive away from home, which rarely went in their favour. Very poor away from home at the start of the season. Very good at home. Uh, about midway through the season, around Christmas time. Cisco Munoz joined and they started off playing a 4-4-2. I think he looked to try and get Dini more involved by playing this 4-4-2, but that that massively affected Saar, who is probably their talisman and best player. He was playing right midfield and a bit more defensive, obviously, than he would be in a in a 4-3-3. Then the final 20 or so games of the season, which pretty much got them promoted, they changed to a 4-3-3. And in that time, Saar played 14 games. He scored eight goals and assisted two. So as a right winger in the 4-3-3, he's a very, very good player. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful they will play this 4-3-3. It, it seems unlikely at the moment because Watford currently have 17% of FPL forwards. They've got 10 strikers in the game currently. Which... Signing one every second day right now. Oh, it's it's ridiculous. I, I I had a phone call yesterday from the Watford chairman. He wants to sign me up as a big man. He, he wants to get me involved. Um, it, no, it's, it's just if, if they're only playing one striker and they've got ten on the bench, like if they've got ten in the squad and they're only playing one. My assumption would be that the likes of Josh King or maybe Emmanuel Denise, who they've signed as a as a striker, will, will play wide. Could potentially play off that left flank. We've seen it from Josh King in in Bournemouth sides in years gone by when Wilson was up top. You'd see. Fraser and King either side of him. So potentially that there is two spots in that Watford side. But even so, 10 strikers is is just ridiculous. Um for, for me, I would be over Watford in terms of where I mentioned I'd like Brentford offensively, Watford defensively are very, very strong. For me, it, it looks at the moment like the template picking goal is Sanchez. I wouldn't stray away from looking into Barkman in goal. Very, very good keeper. And when Cisco came in, they kept 11 clean sheets in 13 games at home. So what more can you ask for from, from a defensive asset at 4.5 million? Are they solid at home? Yes, they are. Play them in every home game. Simple as that. They, 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 they struggle. They, they, um, they keep their shape very, very well. And they try and stop chances, which 
you know, you can't ask for much more from a defender. Yeah, I mean, the, and even in, outside of clean sheets, they conceded very few goals. In Cisco's tenure, in 27 games, they conceded just 16 times. That's just, and 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 what I what I like about them particularly is because they're making the way back up to promotion. They've got Premier League pros in their midfield. I mean, Will Hughes and Cleverly, they've been used to playing in the league. They're almost veterans of the Premier League in terms of how much time they spend in this league. So I I quite like that as well. Yeah, and I think that's always important for a newly promoted club. And, that, and that, that's why I said to you earlier, with regards to who who would I put my money on to stay up, Watford would be the one. Whereas which team could do incredibly well and, and beat everybody's expectations, that would then be Brentford. I, I think Watford have a ceiling of 13th, 14th, 15th if they have a good season. They could, of course, go down. But even, even the players that aren't as experienced, the players like Saar, they've got a a Premier League season under their belt. They've got good performances under their belt. Saar in that game at Vicarage Road against Am- against Liverpool. One of the best performances I saw that season was from him and Deeney up front. So we know they have talent. We know that they can perform at this level. They just need to get some consistency. And under Cisco, I think they've got it in them to keep... A, the, the key for any promoted side, if you're trying to stay in the league, if you can get seven or eight one nil wins under your belt, you're going to stay in, in the division. And I think this Watford side can do that more often than not against the, the you know, the, the, the likes of Burnley, West Ham turn up, Palace turn up. 1-0 wins are highly likely. Sounds like a very Sheffield United model. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's that's exactly it. It's, um, they, will, they will look to create chances, but in terms of the way that, that their philosophy is, we're not going to let you score... And we'll see if we can put one in the back of the net with a few good players. You've got the likes of Saar. If they can, if they are going to play Emmanuel Denise or um, or Josh King out wide, you've got some quality there. I'm I'm worried about who's going to play up top though. Their strikers are not the best finishers. That 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 is for sure. Yeah, I have a there's a lot of there's a lot of. Oops, sorry, uh, just a grey mist of warp. twelve big chances last season. I think the most sort of any player in the championship. Ridiculous. Which is very impressive because he barely played any minutes. Yes. So, in terms of his his expected big chance miss per minute, very very good. Um, no, he's he's. We know we know what what Gray's about. He's he's going to make himself a nuisance. But in terms of quality, it, it's not there at all. I think um, they're most expect, excited about Pedro from whatever I've been reading about the Watford uh, from. The Watford uh, camp, they're really, really excited about what he's going to offer this season. What do you reckon? Yeah, very, and this is Pedro is the one that could be our Bamford. He's he's the one that could perform to a high level. It was difficult for him last season, as it always will be. He's, I think, he was an eighteen-year-old coming into the season, nineteen years old now. Three, uh, two managers, three different systems. He played essentially he played kind of just off of Deeney at times, drifts wide. There was a lot going on for him as a young player. So my, my hope is that they keep they keep Cisco for a full season, which for Watford, not very likely. Um, and he just gets the chance to, to, to prove himself. I think uh, Dennis on, on the left, Saar on the right, uh, Pedro up top, that's really solid and, and could do a very, very good job. And for very, very cheap in FPL. You're looking at Dennis, five million, Pedro, five and a half, Sar six. For me, I'd, if you want to take a punt early doors, Sar's the one. But the other other lot, wait and see and could become value. My, my hope is that for um, for Dennis that's just joined from, from the Bundesliga, if you remember a few years ago, we had uh, Ayu for Palace. He was five million as a forward, but kind of drifted in off the left and came up front a few times. That's what we could see from from Dennis for, for five million. He's like a little bit of a poacher in the box, gets a lot of. Yeah, yeah, and and from 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 what I've seen, can cause a little bit of trouble. So, as as I say, as always with with Watford, could be fireworks, could be good fun. You never know what's going to happen. And no one's nailed except for Sar. No one that we know is nailed in the attack. Right? No, not not in terms of the attack. No, and that that's very much why for me. If you want to take a punt, you go for Saar. Outside of that, all of them are a wait and see. It, 
that there's there's no way we could possibly know what on earth is going on with that Watford lineup when, as I say, they've got ten strikers in the game and two spots. That, that even me that sat and watched them last year fifteen to twenty times, I I could not make an educated guess what's going on there. Yeah, what I what I like about Sarah's a pick right now is because of what you mentioned that Cisco is very tight and you know he tends to defend in numbers etc. I'm guessing Watford's main outlet is going to be the counter. Now on the counter, their main outlet is going to be Sar. So I quite like that. And it's like it's not like he hasn't troubled Premier League defenses in the past. In the last time, in his last tenure in the league, he had five goals and seven assists in 28 appearances. So that's a pretty good. Return in the league as well, so there is proven quality in the league. So, in terms of what they might do, I, I, I'm, I'm liking Sir as a pick for this season. What I'm slightly concerned about, right? From the, it sounds like the identity they're essentially a defensive team. Now we have right. other two promoted teams, which are generally more attacking teams. Now even if Watford score, I think Sar gets a goal, a assist. He doesn't seem like a very high ceiling player purely because what from what I hear about Watford's philosophy. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, 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 I completely. In terms of if you compare them to the other sides, chalk and cheese, completely different, completely different teams, massively so. Um, but as as Prano says, he's proved himself in that league, and I think personally he probably underperformed in the Premier League last last time round, and he got twelve goals and assists in twenty eight games. They will look to him in in the same way Norwich did with Brian Dia. They did Watford did that with Sar. They will stay regimented, stay focused on what they need to do. And he is then their main man. So it's, do you pick the player that is the clear talisman for a slightly more defensive side? Or do you go for the talisman or, or the, the, the secondary talisman in the likes of Mbwemo for a more attacking side in Brentford? That's I'm, the toss up that you've got. It's, it's a really tough one. My, my, in fact, Zof, my memory of Sar is completely the opposite. I see him as an explosive player. I can see him not doing much in two or three games and then if you're patient with him he'll he'll hit a brace and an assist in the third mm-hmm. game because he's that kind of a player even if i now that you mention it luke i mean i remember sar there were so many times where there were chances missed or he just missed the goals etc so i quite agree with the assessment that he might have underperformed compared to his expected stats last time around the league i might just look that up uh, so i'm i i wouldn't be too worried about that so no, my my issue is i don't let's say if he's going to be the primary attacking outlet premier league defenses can just double up on him If he, they, mm-hmm. their simple strategy is going to be, we saw it with Grealish towards the second yep. half of last season. West Ham did that, in fact. Look, you'll be well aware of that. David Moyes, in fact, came up where they'd start doubling up on Grealish, so it might be easy to shut Sar down. I just want to go through Watford's fixtures. I think a lot of people are say they're great, but I don't think they're the best on that great. Now let's say, yeah, let's where uh, are Watford. The first three are Villa, Villa Brighton, and Spurs. Spurs. Now these are decent defenses. You're talking about like you know Villa. You're gonna have Martinez back again. Mings. There's still a decent outfit, even though the second half of the season. Brighton at home, we know. XG Kings. Spurs away with Nuno. It's not going to be the. De- after that is actually when it gets a bit decent. It's Wolves, Norwich, and Newcastle. So, I, I'm not. I had started my first few drafts, but I'm getting a little bit cold feet now again. Listening to you guys, listening to the philosophy, listening to the teams that they are playing, in the first few. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I can't. I can't disagree with you at all. Um, the only, the only thing that I would say is, my hope is that they don't double up on Sar early doors. Potentially, they'll rip. It's something that teams will realise potentially later on. As you say, every everybody knew Jack Grealish was one hell of a player, but until it got to Christmas and, and, and David Moyes turned up with Ryan Fredericks at right wing to stop Grealish and double up with Sue Fowl, it was it was a it was rare that we saw that. So the likes of Aston Villa at home, he could do very, very well in that game. And Watford, Watford needs some results early doors, don't they? So, for me, in those five games, if, if they score five or six goals, he's going to be involved in, in my hope, two or three of them. At the at the same point, they could be completely useless, to score one, and he'll get nothing. But it's it's a punt worth taking, in my opinion, just purely based on what I saw. the ex, The explosive nature of what he does. There's a haul in that opening five games, in my opinion. So, are they any different away from home? I think you had mentioned this earlier. They're a bit more conservative when when they're away. Yeah, very much so, uh, especially under Ivic. So it's it's it has changed now under Cisco. Um, they were slightly they, they they the the way they played didn't change too much under him. It it was a lot worse to, at the start of the season. But they um, 
I think they kept 64%. They, they made made up 64% of their points at home last season, which That's a great for the likes of That's a great not Norwich and Brentford, it was pretty much 50-50. Uh, I just find, yeah, so Brentford was 51.7% at home. Norwich, 49.5, so pretty much bang on. And Watford, uh, 64.8% of points at home. They they scored 44 at home and only conceded 12. And away from home, they scored 19 and, and conceded 18. So away from home, they were pretty much a bang average mid-table championship side. And at home, they swept the floor with everybody. That's so this is, when, if they have a run where they have some very nice home games, that's where you want to favour the likes of uh, Barkman or potentially um, Truce de Kong, who is probably their better centre-half and will likely play the full season. So if they have a run where, let's say, they have Norwich at home, Burnley at home, Palace at home in five, you could bring them in and slot him in for three of those five games quite easily. Sounds perfect for a home away rotation if you guys want to do it. But I think if I get Foster, I'd probably want to get another keeper then from the sounds of this. Sorry, not, yeah. sorry, not Foster, Bachman. He's their first choice, yeah. right? And actually, the the road the home rotation for Watford is West Ham. Hmm. So if you want home rotation throughout the season, you could go Soufal and Truce de Kong in your defence, or whoever the nail. Let's say Danny Rose nails himself down as their as their left wing back or left back. That's no, no love for keeper Feminia. Uh, the, the the issue with Watford is, and to be honest, the reason they probably got promoted is because they had such a strong squad. So, Femenia played 36 of the games, but Ngakia also played 18. Uh, and the other side, Messina played 21 and, and Femenia was like his backup. So, it's difficult to work out what they're going to do. They rotate heavily, which potentially is less likely in the Premier League, but we don't know that yet. Obviously, in the Championship, you play Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. So, the reason Watford probably got promoted was because of their strong backups. They, always, they could always do a Saturday-Tuesday team and basically make five or six changes and, and, and be OK. In the Premier League, Femenia may potentially be more nailed, but I'd have no way of knowing that right now. Well, what about Sierra Elta? I think he, he was one of the big changes in that Watford defence last season as well. I mean, I've read a few uh, pieces and they said that he was actually one of the most important cogs in that defence. He changed it up. Yeah. He's not an option. He's a big Chilean guy. From what I've read, yeah, my, my worry about him the reason so their, their centre half partnership will likely be Truce de Kong from Nigeria and Sirielta from Chile. Um, the reason I don't like Sirielta is he kept not he, he he had nine yellow cards in 24 games. So, in terms of if they keep a clean sheet, it's likely to be a five pointer as opposed to an eight or nine, and no bonus, which yeah, exactly. The, the lack of the lack of bonus, whereas you know. Siri Elta could have been the better player than Truce de Kong, but actually one ends up with seven or eight, the other one ends up with five, or maybe even less because he's got red carded. Um, the temperament is an issue, for sure. So, ugh, yellow cards in nearly 40% of your games, that's not a player I'm going anywhere near. Got it. So, if you're going for the defence, you go for Ikong or you go for Bakken. Don't go anywhere else. Because, I mean, I was thinking about Femenia in my team as well because I like him and I, I have... Uh, I mean, uh, he's we we have a group on WhatsApp where all of us actually are quite fond of him as a romantic Kiko. pick. But Kiko, exactly. But I think <laughs> we're probably going to stay away uh, from Kiko and go for the centre back or the keeper. The problem with the keeper is I, I I don't know how to justify going for a Bachman over a Sanchez. It's just I mean Brighton are proven in the league and they've got the fixtures in the first nine. Do you do you think there's an argument for that? I think potentially the argument. The argument is the saves and bonus. Obviously, the reason that Martinez was so unbelievable last season was when they kept a clean sheet, it wasn't just a six. Martinez, a Martinez clean sheet was eight, nine, ten. We even had a 12-pointer against Brighton, didn't we? So I think the reason for Barkman is if you think Brighton are going to keep 13 or 14 clean sheets and you think Watford are going to keep 10, you probably go for Barkman with the save points. I think you'll probably end up with more points based on saves and bonus than Sanchez, who Brighton are so good that they very rarely give up chances. My, my immediate thought is the the game they played against Palace last year where they lost 2-1 at home and they allowed two chances, I think an XG of about 0.18 and managed to concede both the goals. 
So Sanchez got one point. He didn't make any saves. There's nowhere near a save. Let both both goals in. The the ceiling for a Sanchez is seven, maybe eight. Whereas Bartman could, could easily be getting those 10, 11, 12s. Surely they revert to the main though this season because I think they were by far the unluckiest team in the league last season. That's that's the hope, of course it is. Yeah. But even, even so, even if they even if they revert to the mean and end up with 15, 16 clean sheets, that's just 16 sixes, which is 96. Add on a couple, of, you, you're going to end the season on 130, 140. Bartman could do that with 10 clean sheets. On, on just while we're on that talking point, I actually want to ask both of you because I see Brighton as a very system-oriented team and uh, there's a little bit of a concern if they lose Ben White to Arsenal. Do you think it will affect them defensively? Sof? I don't think so. I think they're a system-oriented team and they have good centre-backs. You'd probably slot Burn in there. I mean, White is a quality player. He probably will be a loss. But I don't think they're dependent on one particular player. The only player I would say they are dependent on is Dunk. Yep. You're in agreement, Luke? Yeah, completely agree. I think um, you look at Ben White, he, he was such a, a good player last season, but he played central midfield, defensive midfield, back, uh, centre-back in a, in a three, in a four. D- Dunk is the one that's so important. And I think you could easily put Lot Dan Byrne into the, the back three or, or, or back four. And also you've got Webster as well. They they just know how they're playing at this point. And also I think if they lose White, they'll just go and sign a, another centre-half that fits the mould. And he'll just slot straight in. All right. That's me on uh, Watford's off. Any more questions? Let's just summarize. So forward, not really. I think it's a minefield avoid. Saar is probably going to look at. Zinkan Nagel, I've heard a lot about. A lot of hype about him from the guys who play Elite Serian. I think that's what it's called. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he He's a strange one. I think he played on the wing in the Elite Serian. Last year, he came in as a central midfielder for Watford. He did okay. Um, his, his underlying stats were quite good, but the last I heard about him was that he was going to get loaned to Nottingham Forest. So it's quite clear he's probably not in their plans and they've, they've made a lot of championship teams aware that they can have him for the season because he's not quite ready for this level. Hmm. Interesting. I, I think you said Sarvi already discussed. That's not now. Going back to defence, what was the name of the guy you mentioned, the Nigerian guy? So you've got Troost, Akong, and the other one I would say is uh, Danny Rose or, or Kiko, of course, would be fantastic if we know that they're, they're nailed to play as, as the fullbacks. What, what are the, what's the goal threat like for the centre-backs you mentioned? Yeah, not, not, not fantastic. Serie Alta's XG was quite literally zero. He didn't have a shot all season. So lots of yellow cards, no goal threat. I wouldn't be going anywhere near. No fun, um, no fun there. No, and and Truce de Kong, he had a couple of shots, but n- nothing, nothing like a, a Zuma or a Vestergaard. So the real gem there in the defense is Buckman. If you're going for Watford defense, the, the convincing one is Buckman. That that would that would be my show, yeah. If you if you, if you fancy their defense, you go Buckman for the season. Cool. Interesting. Last, I think anything else from other teams, we can move on to West Ham. Yeah, let's, let's move on to Luke's team. I mean, a really, really good start of the season in terms of fixtures for you guys. I mean, Newcastle away, Leicester at home, Crystal Palace at home, Southampton away. I like the I like those fixtures from an offensive and a defensive point of view. Uh, how, how, how do you see your team doing this season, Luke? It's a, t- it's a tough one. Um, our squad is thin. We yeah. saw it at the, end, at the end of last season. I have no doubt in my mind we would have come top four if we'd had a stronger squad. Uh, a lot of injuries, a lot of suspensions let us down towards the end of the season. The likes of Suchek and Rice, who had been fantastic all season, both De- Declan Rice picked up his injury at the, very much the wrong time. Mark Noble is then our backup. And behind Mark Noble, we have nobody. Um, and even Noble to... is not a Premier League player anymore. In my opinion. No, bless him. I, I love him. No. Absolute West Ham legend. But he's not... When you look at the... the, the the drop down from Rice or Suchek Noble is that astronomical. It's 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 the reason we didn't come top four, which is a shame because I love Mark Noble, but the level just isn't there. And, and you look at then the level between Antonio and our backup striker, which is quite literally nobody. Um, it got to a point where we either had to play an eighteen-year-old who had never played a Premier League minute, or Yarmolenko who can't run anymore. So 
we then we then tried to play without a striker and kind of have Lingard, Ben Rama, and Bowen just floating about trying to create chances. It's it, it, it's not good enough. So my hope is that we can sign. We need at least six players to cope with Europa League, in my opinion. Six to eight players, loans, free agents, whoever you need to get in, get them in. Because without that, we will struggle in the Premier League. I think um, the deeper we get into Europe, if we don't sign more than five or six players, it's going to let down our Premier League form. So if you want to jump on Soufal or Antonio early on before the European run kicks off, by all means, have a go. But once Europa League starts, we... We will struggle. Yeah, because I don't. I don't think there's Europa League qualifying this time, right? I think you guys are directly qualified to the group group stage. There's not none of that preseason congestion. Yeah, so which is which is very positive. That that affected us a lot when we first moved into the stadium, when we lost to uh, the the, the world class Romanian outfit Astra Gugu twice in a row. Um, yeah, that that affected our preseason massively. So. I am glad we are straight in, but at the same point, going away to Romania, Slovenia, France, Spain on a Thursday night to then play on a Sunday when you've not got a backup striker or a backup defensive midfielder, it's it's tough. You, you, you see the likes of Arsenal and Tottenham in the Europa League. They kind of use it as their their way to get the reserves into the squad. We'll get, We'll give the second team a bit of a chance. We don't have a second team. That doesn't exist for us. If you play a... The second team, you've got Mark Noble and a twelve-year-old in midfield, and you put you put Big Dave from the pub up front. Like it's it's uh, it's 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 uh, we're a badly run team who have a fantastic manager. That's the only reason we had such a good season. I just yeah, want to talk no. about the fixtures. You have Newcastle away first up, which could be decent, could be difficult. I think you guys. This was the opening fixture last season as well, right? I think you lost it two 0 something like that. Yes. Uh, we, I think we only lost four games all season against the teams outside of the top six, the, the, the well-known top six, and two of them were against Newcastle. So we, we just don't like the way they play, the, the, the direct nature of which they counter with St. Maximin and Wilson. It just seems to massively affect our defence. We, we struggle against the direct explosive players so as we were just mentioning with Saar maybe Saar against West Ham could be one to take a punt on yeah because it's uh, it's it's two styles meeting together right because West Ham themselves are a counter attacking team so you all do like playing against teams that hold possession so any and Newcastle I would say play in exactly the same way as the West Ham does except for I think West Ham are much better in quality and set pieces but both are counter attacking teams that's why it doesn't suit you guys no. yeah very much it's 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 the the style that we struggle against is playing ourselves, which is is quite funny, really, because you'd think that they'd know a way around it, but apparently not. We we really struggled against those sort of sides last season. We just couldn't. We don't we don't have the quality to break them down. We had the likes of Lingard, Ben Rama, Bowen, who are very quick. Their acceleration is very impressive. Antonio, of course, quick as well. But in terms of quality, outside of Ben Rama, who had a poor season. We don't really have it. Who are you all in the market for? What are the murmurs, rumours when it comes to this? Yeah, so if, if, if everything goes to plan, my, my dream transfer window, we would sign Sam Johnston from West Brom. We would sign Matthias Pereira from West Brom, who also is, is linked to us. We would sign Tammy Abraham. Milenkovic from, I believe, uh, Fiorentina. Big strap and centre half, six foot four, heads the ball, no nonsense, which is exactly what David Moyes wants. To play next to Alf Bonner would be really important. And then we're also linked to another Czech midfielder, um, Kral, who played in the European Championships, came off the bench for Czech Republic a lot. And um, as I say, we, we just need that backup, that backup midfielder, which if we could get those five in along with maybe a lone, a lone player, maybe a, a Harvey Elliott from Liverpool bit of talent out wide that we could use in the in the European games and, and off the bench would be great. If we could sign those six players, I'd be very, very happy with the window. At the moment, I'm not hearing anything concrete about us signing anyone, which is a worry. You could sell rice to us. I think that could fund all those other transfers, right? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we don't mind rice either. You can have Lingard, that's fine. It works for you guys. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm glad that people got to see what Rice can do during these European Championships. 
Um, I think players like him go under the radar and you can quite easily say, oh, they just pass the ball backwards or they do this and that. He's such an intelligent footballer. He is always in the right place. There's, there's an art to being in the right place at the right time in the box, but there's also an art to being in the right place at the right time defensively. When you're shielding that back four, he is always in the right. He will always spot the through ball that's coming in and get a foot in, get a toe in, clear the ball. Very, very important and very underrated player. So, given, 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 you guys have the good fixtures at the start of the season. In attack, where do you go? Antonio or Bust? Yes. Um, the obvious that the one that could go a bit mad over the course of preseason would be Ben Rama. If you know, if we if we play. Leamington Spa and win 6-0 and Ben Rama gets a hat-trick. Everyone will love him, won't they? Even though he's, he's playing against the local Sunday League team. He's the sort of player that it could quite easily be a pre-season. Everybody loves him during pre-season on FPL Twitter. For me, Just need Flapjack to go crazy about him. That's, that's it. exactly it. That, yeah. all, all we need is one big account to say yeah. Ben Rama is essential and everybody will be on him. But um, yeah, for, for me, defensively, I'll be, I'll be on Soufal and offensively, Antonio, if we don't sign Tammy. Interesting you mentioned Sufal because I've got him currently in my draft in the rotation with Watford, like you had mentioned. So I was just looking mm -hmm. at the fixtures again, Newcastle away, Leicester, and then Palace. This is before your Europa League kicks in. The first international break is at the end of game week three, and then you have Southampton, Man United, and Leeds. They aren't necessarily easy fixtures per se. You could easily get only one or two clean sheets in those. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the, the reason I like him is he's, he's improved offensively very much. The, the second half of the season, he really came into his own. He, to start with, we were impressed with him from a defensive point of view. He really improved our back four. A lot of clean sheets came our way. Second half of the season, to be honest, it was probably because he was, he was utilised as a wing back a little bit more. He found his, found his rhythm. He's a very, very good crosser of the ball. And when you've got the likes of Antonio in the box causing problems, if we were to sign Tammy, if you've, if you've got Tammy playing up front and you maybe even use utilise Antonio off the left or off the right, two, two big men that could create chaos in the box, Soufal could be a very good option. Yeah, I like. To, I think Tammy would be a great fit for you guys. I think more so than yeah. Villa since Villa have Watkins because I really don't trust Antonio's hamstrings to last a Europa League campaign. No, no if, if he has to play... Sunday, Thursday, Sunday, Thursday. He he won't even make that Leicester game. <laughs> like, or, or the, he won't even make the Southampton game after after the international break. Yes. So yeah, I, yeah, think... I think Sufal, by the way, just to start that I read on him in the second half of the season, he was in the top three scoring FPL defenders. Without keeping oh, really? any clean sheets. I think that too. They barely kept any clean sheets. It was just four, four, a bunch of fours in a row. And his form continued into the Euros. He had a great campaign for the Czech as well. He was really, really good. I yep. mean, yeah, he's got he's got that little bit of a Robertson kind of tenacity where he's always running down the wing, always. He's always there as an outlet on that right hand side for the hammer. So yeah, I, I think it's um it, we we kind of operate in the opposite way to Liverpool, where I, I'd say you look at their two fullbacks, Trent is the better footballer. He he he's I think we have that from Creswell. Creswell is our better technician. He's better on the ball, a be better crosser of the ball. Robertson is, is our Soufal. You know, we, Soufal will constantly run, constantly put tackles in, run all day long up and down that wing, get the, get the tackles in, get the crosses in. He, he also even runs into the box late sometimes. So you, I think there's goals in him too. Yep, yep, yep. He was in the top eight defenders in the league last season for XA per 90. And there was actually another, there are two West Ham defenders above him on that table. And there's just not Cresswell, who's great. We know that. But uh, no chance you you guys are going to revert back to three at the back with Masuaku fit. What's the thinking there? I'd love to see it. I'd, lo I'd love to see it because, because Masuaku would become a fantastic option. But I've been saying this for two or three seasons. We've we've had him for a long time now. I think we I think we bought him the season we moved into the stadium. So unfortunately, he's very he's he's a classic West Ham player that has all of the ability, just constantly gets injured. As, as you know, Jack Wilshere, Antonio, Andy Carroll, we just seem to find these players that constantly get injured despite every time they play looking fantastic. 
Interesting. If he is fit, though, do you all revert, see West Ham reverting back to that formation? Potentially now we don't have Lingard because we were playing the 4-2-3-1 so that we could fit Lingard, Bowen, Ben Rama in, in behind Antonio along with Fornells as well. Um, potentially with Lingard gone, you're looking at the likes of Fornells and Ben Rama in behind a striker and you could then play Rice and Suchek in midfield, let Soufal and Masuaku bomb on. It, it would work very well. It's just can Masuaku last long enough to actually put... 10, 15 games together where he can get you some points. I'm not yeah. sure. One other worry I have is actually it's one of the few positions in which you guys do have options. So I can easily see Moyes using a Masuaku in the Europa League because he's good enough quality. Yeah. So Rotation. that's another that's another worry I'd have. What I wanted to ask was Diop. Do you think Diop is could possibly get in the team? I think he's only one at 4.5 in the defence. <sighs> the issue with Diop is he's a fantastic centre-half. I, I could actually see him playing at a top team in the Premier League. The issue that he has with West Ham is that he likes to play up, play around with the ball. He's, he's, he's much more John Stones than he is, you know, a West Ham player. He, he, he can find a pass. He likes to dribble with the ball, push forward, uh, engage with the press, push past the press. That's not what David Moyes wants. Yep. They, David Moyes wants a defender that if a ball comes in and it falls at his feet, he's not going to try and take on a man and then find a pass. He wants Craig Dawson in the box to boot the ball out off the pitch, which is completely fine. Dave, David Moyes is a man who plays by numbers and he's proven over the years to be a top Premier League manager, especially defensively. But he has always had those defenders that will clear the ball. And Diop does not match that system, unfortunately. Um, neither did Balbuena and we've now let him go on a free agent because he he looked to play with the ball as well. So you look at Pellegrini, the, the, the back four was at times Masuaku, um, Fredericks, Diop and Balbuena because he liked to play the ball. Whereas it completely changed as soon as David Moyes came into the club. It was instantly, we're going to revert back to 1970s football. We're going to let the attackers do what they can do, but we're going to get rid of the ball and stop, stop teams from getting chances. Interesting. So yeah, I think to sum it up, I think up top... This, there is no other option. I think up top is just Antonio. But yeah. What about Bowen though? I, I saw in the uh, preseason game he took the penalty. I do know that Noble wasn't on the pitch. Antonio wasn't on the pitch. Who's, who's the penalty taker? Rice, time? right? If I, if I... Yeah, it, it, sh it should be Declan Rice. But he did miss his last penalty. And my, my, my hope is that we, we buy Tammy and then he can just take the penalties. We, we, need, we need a penalty taker on the pitch because last season it took us months and months to get a penalty and then when we got the penalty everybody turned around to David Moyes and was kind of like who do you want us who do you want to take it mate like it, it, there was clearly no planning for that penalty taker because it didn't look like we were ever going to get one um so I'd like someone at the club who's going to be playing every minute of the game that will step up and take a penalty so that makes Tammy an even better option if we do sign him because I believe he's six and a half million in FPL yes and I, he will almost insist on taking penalties Tammy yep. loves these like stat pad goals. Yeah. So, he's also the biggest uh, prima donna I have seen on the pitch. He complains so he complains much when he's constantly. on the pitch. He's always complaining on the pitch. Uh, just, 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 I actually want you to spell it out. Do, do you reckon Cresswell is worth 0 0.5 more compared to us so far? No, not for me. Um, if, if the first half of the season has, has stayed as it was, then probably yes. But actually for me, despite the fact Creswell was taking free kicks and corners, Tufal was a better attacking asset than Creswell in the second half of the season. Um, and we we strangely rotate our corner takers sometimes. So Creswell takes from the left and then a Bowen or Tufal will take from the right. Um, yeah, for me, Tufal is the obvious one. And especially if we, we go to a three at the back where Creswell will, will likely be a central defender. Right. I mean, just, just for the stat lovers out here also, I mean, Antonio is somebody you definitely consider up front as well because in the league, he's got the highest XG per 90 numbers out of all the attackers. So when he's on the pitch, he's going to get points. So that's something you should yes. be mindful about. Absolutely. Yep. Given the uh, fixtures that West Ham have at the start of the season, I do fancy a little bit of Antonio. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be... I'm, I'm likely to, to probably be on Antonio as well at the start. 
anything else i think you had something to ask about olise ella yeah yeah i mean yeah, while we're with luke and he's here and he's seen the championship last season uh, I, i remember you being really excited on twitter as well because olise joined palace 5.5 million i saw some highlights he, he reminds me of a bigger version of ese so what do you have to tell us about him yeah that, that just a phenomenal talent he so where we talk about four and a half million midfielders on on gaffa last year he was four and a half million and then produced a season with seven goals and 12 assists so could you imagine billy gilmore next season were to do that or gibbs white that you just just go down as a god wouldn't they along with lundstrom and dallas that just unbelievable numbers he took a lot of set pieces very good on free kicks and corners really really strong and the thing that i like about him as well is he wins a lot of fouls so if he's getting fouled in and around the box you've got potential for free kicks and penalty assists to go his way as well um which we know we know how palace play obviously hodgson has gone i don't see them changing too much there's there's a huge rebuild unfortunately so we we can't be 100% sure how they're going to play but zahar off one wing olise off the other it's quite clear they're going to try and be explosive and direct or it, it, and if they don't then they're probably not being wise very good crosser of the ball as well with benteke in the box i think it makes benteke and elise uh very good options yeah and it's a bit of wait of a watch given the fixtures also i think we can give him some time to settle right. yeah that and that's that's the positive for me is the fact that he's been priced so low they start the season with new management new players very difficult fixture run we can literally sit there and just enjoy what he's doing and see if he fits the bill whether he can play at this level yet if he they can't don't have, get him in they have the ta- talent pool up front i mean and the good thing is while they have the tough fixture on nazi is going to be injured we're expecting him back around november and i'm i'm excited to watch what that front three is going to look like together when saha is here and elise play together and i mean from in terms of style that palace might adopt vera has mentioned that he definitely wants to play a more attacking form of football uh so that's something worth looking out for right. that's yeah it would, it would be it would be difficult to be more defensive than roy wouldn't it bless him yeah. but um yeah I, which it, what what is what is the hard this season six and a half seven midfielder he could become a, become an option i think must be yeah. around seven i guess that's been his standard price for the past few seasons yeah so let's just have a look at your draft now look why don't you walk us through it Yeah, I'll get that up now. So, could you read it out for the guys who've got on who are listening on audio? You could read it out please. Yeah, that's not a problem. So, I've got currently Sanchez and Gal, Trent, Shaw, Diaz and Soufal, Buendia, Fernandez, Salah and Saar up front, Tony, Wilson and Antonio. I've also got Foster, Ailing and Gilmore currently. So, you know, it's I've taken a few punts on championship players that have come up tony wendy and saw so i am a, and that's just not for the pod that's not no i i will i will not be changing that too much I, i'll definitely have at least two that's for sure that's interesting um, that's very interesting it just, remember we were talking right before you came on the general conventional wisdom is avoid players from promoted sides and i love to see that somebody who has actually watched these players closely have bring three of them to go with it's something very refreshing to see Yeah well it's just my 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 thinking on it at FPL is we go into every weekend hoping we can accumulate the most points it's quite a simple game isn't it but you can you can bring in a player like let's say James Ward Prowse over the course of the season he may well end up on the same points as Brendan Deer or Sar but it's a lot of free you've got to hope that he scores some free kicks or Vestergaard heads some goals in and whereas Brendan and Sar every single week they're going to be explosive they're going to run at their full backs they're going to get shots away they could have a tremendous season like we saw from the likes of Jack Harrison or Rafinha at Leeds if if Villa Watford Brentford whoever it may be perform in the way that we we know they can do there's a big season in them whereas James Ward Prowse a bit of a, a bit of a, a dull pick who if if all of a sudden he has a bad year on free kicks and the corners don't go their way you're looking at 110 120 points whereas a Brian Deer or Sar could match Jack Harrison and get 160 yep this is an interesting thing because i do think in the midfield bracket in particular i think between the 6 to 7 million that there's not much choice 
So I, these are probably but, the best picks, I think, in that bracket. I think it's flooded with good options. That in midfield? Price, but... Between yep, 6 yeah. to 7? Ooh. Yep. A lot of potential good price midfield. I actually like that because there are too many players you can move on to. There's, there's Dallas. There's, sorry, there's Harrison in that bracket. There's Bowen in that bracket. There's Bowen Rafinha in that bracket. I don't know if he's on. I don't know. I, 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 he wasn't too bad last season. Yeah, but he's not a consistent. I mean, eight player. goals, six assists is decent for somebody I at that price. I'd rather get Suchek. There's Rafinha also in that price bracket. There's Trossard in that price bracket. There's there's the Wolves guys in that price bracket. It's a lot of people you can see. Z- there's Saka good. in that price bracket. Saka is so good. I still don't agree with Trossard or the Brighton guys. So we differ, I guess, on that. And that's for other pods to come. Correct. Which <laughs> yeah. to but yeah. I like what you said. Look, we're just going to go through some questions really quick. We've already run close yeah. to 90 minutes. So we'll just skim through these. I think we've probably covered most of them. So I'm have. just going to... Quickly, just going to uh, skim through if there's anything that Luke hasn't answered. Is there a 4.4 million defender from the promoted sites? FPL AA33 is asking this question. Yeah, so the only one that I can see potentially is if Norwich change up their system, which they could do. Norwich, talking to a few Norwich fans, they may well end up playing with a back three, which was apparently what Farker wanted to do when they came up last time, but was unable to do it because of injuries. Potentially, um, Oma Bedelli. I think he's called, um, could play as the third centre-half, but the, the options are very much limited. All right. Next question is from FPL Freaky Friday. Apart from Gilmore, any cheap starting defensive midfield options from promoted teams? Gilmore's definitely the one you go for, in my opinion. Um, Brentford, not some, Brentford, there's no options. And Watford, I think they've all been priced at five or five and a half. All right. Uh, next question is from a friend of ours, Rich P underscore FPL. Uh, what speed were you clocking running past your neighbor's top? Well, I, th- I think Adama's hit 36 kph in the prem. So I'm looking, I reckon I'm looking about 34, 35. I'm, I, 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 was, I, was, I was enjoying that game so much. I reckon I'd, I'd, I'd got myself pumped up with adrenaline. I, I think I hit some high numbers there, that's for sure. Yeah, based on the footage, I'd, I'd agree. I was expecting 37, to be honest, when you mentioned Adama's number. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that. I, 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 I think I'd struggle in a race against Adama, but in that one moment, I reckon I, over that 10 metres, I was quick. All right, and the last question is from me, Luke. The biggest bargain from the promoted teams in terms of FPL is going to be? <sighs> in terms of a bargain, I am going to say Brian and Buemo. Nice. That's a good shot. That's a good shot. Even Tony counts as a bargain, 6.5 million. I mean, you had me thinking. I wasn't very hot on Tony, I'll be honest, because uh, I, I thought the fixtures were kind of so-so when it came to Brentford. But, uh, you know, you watch the championship and you know what they're about. And I didn't know that they were so attacking in their play style. So I'm certainly thinking a lot more about yep. Tony than I was I think, previously. I think Tony, as Bakar says, nailed it my game week one team. Yep. <laughs> all right so that's it from us thank you so much luke for uh, joining us today it's 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 been an education for zoff and me i'm sure uh and it's been great having you on here we'll probably see you at some point during the season as well we've really enjoyed having you on the pod and uh guys if you haven't already make sure you hit the like and subscribe button Bucker, zoff and me will probably be joining you guys around next tuesday or wednesday we're going to be talking taking a deeper look at all the defenders and keepers. Uh, and yeah, that's it from me. Any last words, Luke? Just good luck for the season, guys. I hope it's a hope it's a good one. I hope it's an enjoyable one. We'd love to have you on again for a and a Luke, closer to the kickoff FPL once we have all the signings in. Would you be up for that? That sounds great. That sounds fantastic. We'll do a live stream. Today was recorded since we had a lot of new tech, but I'd love to have you on for a live stream closer to when the season's going to start. Sounds great. Yeah, you're a first uh, pod uh, where we're actually showing off our little new intro today. So quite excited for that. Pleasure yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be enjoying that one later. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. That's it from us. We'll see you next week, guys. Take care. Thank you.